crushed at the polls. Morocco's ruling party suffers a heavy defeat in parliamentary elections, but with the king retaining so much control, will a new liberal government be able to deliver on voter demands? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Morocco's election. Well, it could be described as catastrophic for Morocco's socially conservative Party of Justice and Development, or PJD. Previous elections kept them in power for a decade, but on Wednesday, they were crushed, losing around 90% of their parliamentary seats. Now, before we get into just why the party was beaten so badly, let's take a quick look at Morocco itself. The North African nation borders the disputed Western Sahara to the south and Algeria to the east. It has a population of just over 37 million, of which 27% is under the age of 15. The vast majority of the country is Muslim and is also one of the Arab League's 22 member states. In 2020, Morocco's GDP was $113.5 billion, and it's considered to be the fifth strongest economy in Africa. But despite its economic strength on the continent, Morocco has been suffering, with the pandemic pushing the country into deep recession for the first time since 1995. Allegations of mismanagement and corruption have seen many lose faith in the current government, and arguably in the system itself. Now, just barely over half the electorate turned out to vote with the majority backing opposition liberal candidates. Coming in second was the Party of Authenticity and Modernity, also known as PAM. But the big winner was the National Rally of Independence, which won roughly a quarter of the parliamentary seats. A spokesperson says their victory shows just how tired Moroccans are of politics as usual. These results prove that Moroccans today want change and want an alternative. And we believe that the National Rally of Independence Party is that alternative. Given the electoral program it presented to the citizens, which resonated well with them during the election campaign. But can they translate their victory at the polls to success in governing? That may not be so straightforward. Morocco is, after all, a constitutional monarchy, and most of the power lies in the hands of King Mohammed VI. He picks the prime minister, controls the economy, and not much really gets done without his approval. So even with the ruling party's stunning defeat, how much can really change? Well, to discuss that, I'm joined now from Rabat by Nufal Aboud. He is the executive director and co-founder of the Nordic Center for Conflict Transformation. Nabil Adel is in Casablanca. He is a former counselor to the Speaker of Morocco's House of Representatives. And Mohamed Dadawi is professor of political science at Oklahoma City University and author of Moroccan Monarchy and the Islamist Challenge. Thanks all so much for being with me. Uh, you know, before we look at what might happen going forward, I need to ask first, uh, and Nabil, I'll start with you. What happened to the PJD? Yes, what happened to, to the PJD was, was really unexpected. Even the, the most uh, pessimistic uh, uh, forecast didn't, uh, didn't foresee this, uh, this crash, this, uh, this, uh, this defeat. We were, we, were thinking that we were thinking that it would succeed at being fourth or fifth, but not uh, divide its, its number of seats by 10. I think Moroccan, uh, the, the Moroccan voters punished the the PGD for, for for many reasons. The first, the first one is that uh, he he failed at delivering many of its promises. Uh, he he made a lot of concessions, even to the core of it, of its ideology, uh, like the normalization of, with Israel, uh, the, the Arabization of uh, of, uh, of the education. Uh, a lot of lot of uh, concessions being made uh, at, at the expense of its own uh, solid uh, voter uh, voter base. So I think these were uh, things that that Moroccan voters did not forgive uh, the the ruling party for. But you have also the the good and very sound uh, electoral campaign carried out by the other parties, although using a lot of money, although trying to, to transform this, this election into a mercato where, uh, where candidates changed 
their obedience at the last minute. Right. But all in all, uh, you have internal factors that explain this, this, this debacle and also external factors. Okay. Uh, using money and arguably social media, we've heard uh, a lot about that as well. I want to get to that in a minute. But first of all, let me ask Mohammed if you agree uh, with Nabil there that really the PJD only, only has itself to blame. Uh, well, yes and no. I think uh, on one part, yes, strategically speaking, the PJD made certain uh, mistakes in terms of governance once they had the power or nominal power, we should say, because in the context of Morocco, as your report suggested, is, is accurate. Morocco is still a monarchy that does control a lot of the decision making. So, yes, I mean, they have promises, as uh, uh, Mr. Nabil said, but those promises cannot be delivered if they don't have, you know, full-fledged control over the executive uh, executive power as you would expect from any, uh, you know, government. Uh, and on the other hand, of course, I, I see this more of a, uh, just a, a historical uh, structural change on par with what happened in the past in Morocco. This is not the first time that we are engaged in this what I call a recycling of party coalitions that happens periodically in order to kind of give a certain legitimacy to kind of the modern state in Morocco with an effective kind of control from the monarchy itself. So, yes, I mean, these parties uh, run effectively or not, but we know that the uh, elections in Morocco are, stru are engineered, structurally speaking, the introduction of the coefficient also did not help the PJD and didn't help themselves. I wrote long time ago in 2016 that after the blockage, what was called the blockage in Morocco at that time, by which uh, Ben Kiran, the prime, former prime minister, head of the government, was ousted, there should have been, I think, a calculated decision by the PJE, PJD to withdraw from the government. I think that would have accrued more popularity at that time. The fact that they stayed, they kind of overstayed their welcome, and they, dead, they in a sense, died by a thousand cuts, you know, over the period of 10, of 10 years. But ultimately, of course, this is a, P a resounding defeat for the PJD, a historical defeat for them. Uh, and, and in my view, they have done their job for the regime over the, ten, uh, the last 10 years. They managed to normalize with Israel under the ages, of course, of an Islamist government, right? And they managed, of, of, of course, most importantly, to manage Did they the manage tempest. that or did the king manage that? Well, they, but the king needed to add a little bit of legitimacy to that decision. That decision is still unpopular in Morocco. I mean, if you look at the Arab barometer, of course, uh, uh, research and surveys, Moroccans are against that decision. But it helps if you have an Islamist party at the helm what that decision is taking. It okay. legitimizes it in the eyes of those, of course, that may be a little bit reticent. Right. But ultimately, this is a it doesn't change much in the context of Moroccan landscape. Okay. The decisions are coming from a certain uh, uh, certain uh, uh, decision makers in the power. OK, no, no fall. I'll get your opinion as well on what happened to the PJD. But I also want to ask you about the RNI uh, and why you think it's uh, per performed so well. Do you think it was a rejection more of the old guard in the RNI success or um, were they really savvy campaigner campaigners this time? Exactly. There were savvy campaigners this time, uh, and especially in social media. What we witnessed in social media uh, during the political campaign was a, a, great, uh, uh, a great engagement in, uh, among uh, Moroccan people that we haven't witnessed before. And uh, whether it was it a positive engagement or um, a negative engagement, it was an engagement, and it was, uh, and the RNI did really well in those campaigns. They were prepared for the electoral campaign. And also, they used the division within the uh, PJD uh, political parties in, inside the, the, the political parties in itself. Uh, we have been witnessing a crisis at the leadership level. They, uh, they used that uh, to their favors. And of, of course, Morocco and Moroccan people, they need something different. The PJD was in power for a long time, two terms. Uh, and especially uh, for the last term, they have a very weak prime minister, and uh, that did not really help. Okay. Um, Nabil, I'll come back to you, because as Mohammed was really alluding to, uh, here we're going to see again the shuffling, the forming of coalitions. Um, 97 seats, it's, it's not a majority. So how easy will it be, you know, really to rule Morocco uh, without a clear majority for anyone anyway? I think this is this is the landscape of the, of the political system in Morocco. So it is built around the idea that nobody can, no party can get the majority to 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 rule alone, and we need this kind of uh, of coalitions to to build 
in order to to be able to to, to form a government. This this was was the case since the independence of this country, and it is not going to change overnight. So yes, we still have uh, a system based on on this uh, on this kind of of trying to have many parties forming a coalition, and so that nobody is. Is in uh, in control of the whole executive uh, apparel. So today we will, we will witness, I think, in my, in my opinion, less uh, tensions than in 2016. I think we have two to three parties that can form a government easily. Uh, most of them have uh, have worked together before. I'm thinking about the NRI, uh, the Istiklal, the, the Socialist Party. I think they, with another party, they, they can form easily a coalition. They, they, they worked together in 98, 2002, 2007, 2016. So they know how to work with each other and they can form easily a coalition that can, that can form a government very, very quickly. I think this time we will witness much less tensions around this operation because as we know last time, uh, there were a lot of uh, lots of what we call blockage uh, to prevent uh, Ben from forming another government, and we and we and we had to wait for six months without government. The the king had to intervene right. to, right. to to name Mr. Atman to form a government, which which was done okay. in a, I think in less than a week. So yes, I think this time we will not see a lot of lot of tensions in the, in, the, in, the, in this coalition. Maybe what okay. will be a really the challenge is what will come after the, 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 the government coalition. Right. Uh, we're going to get to that. I just need to ask Mohammed one more kind of more pointed question uh, about this result right now and what's behind it. Uh, Mohammed, does the rise of these liberal parties actually say something about changing social values in Morocco, or is it just more a reaction to whatever dissatisfaction with the last 10 years of the ruling party? I think it's the latter. I think, uh, and as the, the guest also alluded to, it's, it's much more of a reaction to, in a sense, the disastrous 10 years of the PJB rule. Uh, they were not particularly that good at governance. And of course, they were beset by internal divisions and and, and the problem, of course, in Morocco is that most of the decisions, even decisions when, when they are made by the uh, powers that be, it's the government that is blamed in the, in, in the final analysis, right? This kind of this duality in Morocco between the regime and the state itself. And the state, while it's controlled nominally by whoever is in the government, coalitionally speaking, right? More the Moroccans, of course, would only have to blame those that are in uh, in their eyes are in control of those decisions so most of the economic woes and, and social divisions and so on the pandemic did not help at, uh, at all uh, with morocco as well a lot of people lost their jobs there's a great deal of unemployment and so on so the uh, diet economic situation also has something to blame and you know as they say in the united states it's the economy stupid in the final analysis morocco when you know like any other country when uh, economically speaking, things are not going well. You have to blame the incumbents, and the incumbents in this case are the PJD. I don't think the social values have changed in Morocco because these are parties that are not, uh, you know, new to the scene. These are old, recycled, as I said, reshuffled parties coming back to power because, of course, they are willed. It, it's willed that way. And, okay. and I'll go back to my point: the, P, the PJD has done its job for the monarchy and for the regime has pacified and managed that tempest of the Arab uprising after 2011. They had those mm -hmm. setbacks, of course, by 2016, where they needed to get out and be in the opposition. And that's, I think, the strategic miscalculation and mistakes that do them, doomed them. And since then, that's where, uh, as Mr. Aboud said, that's where you have that division in the leadership, right? After Bikram was tossed out, right? Of the uh, government, right? According to Blokaj. Okay. And, of course, uh, um, forced to basically uh, resign from his position in the, uh, in the PJD. Okay. Nufal, let me ask you. I mean, is there any chance we might start to witness a slow progression uh, toward the king ceding even more power to the parliament? Um, and do Moroccans even want that? You know, what's interesting about Morocco is the coexistence between two systems, a system that is based on a modern uh, 
concept of separation of power, where you have political parties, you have a, a government, parliament, and judiciary. Uh, and on the other hand, there is a parallel system which is based on a traditionalist kind of uh, power setting based on the framework of uh, the commander of the faithful. Uh, that's where the royal institution sits. And it functions within a unicity of power with the councillors uh, on the other side. The importance of this uh, settings is that it actually limits uh, the risks of uh, deviation of threshold, if you want to call it, in terms if there is a change in the in, in the political parties and the leadership with the government and coalitions. So what I would say is that we won't be able to see in Morocco uh, a, a shift, a, a risk of change uh, that will occur uh, under this government, as we have seen it, for example, in other countries, such as, for example, Tunisia, uh, where everybody was excited about uh, the, uh, the democratic elections. And now we witness, in fact, that the suspension of all democratic institutions, we won't see this. Uh, but uh, the royal institutions will be managing the risk of deviation of uh, negative change in a, in a way or another. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, it, there will be any increase or decrease, but uh, the royal institution is there. It has its settings, either whether the framework of a modern system uh, that considers the, the head of, uh, of the king as the head of state, or within the framework of uh, the commander of the faithful, which has uh, uh, more of a loose and flexible uh, ways of dealing in politics. Okay. So what, what I would like to add, uh, and I don't think it has been mentioned here, uh, is the electoral reform that has occurred in Morocco. We will see more women in the political participation and, and seats uh, reserved for women. And that's the, the massive change that we will see during this uh, coming government and election. Interesting. You know, those electoral changes are actually can be quite confusing uh, for outsiders to really understand. And, and some say that also could have influenced the outcome of this election because votes uh, are apparently now allocated based on the number of people registered rather than the actual votes cast. Yeah. Nabil, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Nabil yes. it, can, you, can you explain exactly how it works, who it benefits and who it might uh, work as a disadvantage for? We'll go back to, to your question about uh, are, we, are, we, are we seeing a change in, in the structure of the regime? Let us, let us notice something. It is the first time in an Arabic country where Islamist party ruled for two consecutive mandates and it didn't end either in a, in a bloody civil war or in a military coup. So, so th this is new to the Arab world. It is the first time we had a, 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 an Islamist party that ruled for two, two mandates and it ended very, very peacefully. Mm. Uh, and this is, this is due to the nature of, of the Moroccan regime. And the Moroccan regime is, is able to, uh, to take inside the, the system all oppositions, uh, make them uh, rule with, it, with, uh, with, with institution, and at the end, use them to, to, to make its, its rule even stronger. So this is a very, very important uh, phenomenon to, to note. As for, for why the, this system of uh, the, 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 the voting system punished the, the PGD because it is a system, if, if, if you observe, the first party, the NRI, has for 30% less, uh, less uh, votes than uh, the PGD in, in, uh, in 2016 because the construction of, of, of the system is based around the idea that we need to have equally weak parties. Okay. We, will, we don't <laughs> want to see a strong party emerging from, from the, the election. Okay. So either in terms of, of votes, of the, the mechanism of counting the votes, of, uh, of the decomposition of, of the, the map, the electoral map, you will, you will, all, you will always have okay. the first party always needing some some party uh, some other parties to rule you will never have one or two parties having enough votes to form uh, by themselves uh, a government okay and this is that, one of the pillars oh, of the electoral system in morocco uh yeah uh, mohammed go ahead 
And if I may, that's what I say that this is what we call electoral engineering, right? And this is done by design in order to mitigate in, in, uh, uh, in the, uh, the fact that a party with a majoritarian mandate will actually be in power, right? And that would force the regime, the monarchy in this case, to make certain concessions. But that's not going to happen in Morocco because of the nature of the elections itself. And I don't think there is that will to see more of the powers you know themselves now, and I know wanted to respond just to one the, the comment that you know the we want to prevent deviations in the systems and so on and so forth, which is fine for the monarchy to do as an arbiter. But the monarchy is not an arbiter in the political system. It is part of the political system. It is the uh, power with the veto, uh, with with the great discretionary powers and control over the system. Um, you know, and I think. Uh, yes, Moroccans, for the most part, at least in, in my research, whatever, they are attached to the monarchy. And the monarchy is seen as a positive force and whatnot, right? But I think it might be better for Morocco in the long term to actually enable some true democratic renewal, democratic changes and democratic reforms in the country. And in a sense, lessen the ability of this uh, uh, electoral engineering mechanisms, of course, to control much of the fate of these political parties. Because in the final analysis, political parties are not seen to be, and you look at the barometer as well, the surveys, they're not seen as real uh, uh, mobilization of forces, okay. the capacity, of yes. course, to affect change. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, Nufal, go ahead quickly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, just quickly. You, you know, we have to contextualize a little bit this election or what's, what's happening in the world in terms of democracy. The state of democracy in the last 10 years has been reported, reported to be backsliding everywhere. <coughs> there is erosion in terms of democracy. And uh, in countries where uh, we had so much hope and there were models of democracy in terms of ele elections and so forth like that, we have seen them actually falling back decades back. Uh, we're talking, for example, on what happened, for example, in elections in the US and how the social movement in the US actually supported the coup or attempted coup against the president in itself, uh, Donald Trump. We have seen uh, what's, uh, what's happening also in Tunisia and how democracy has backslided in decades. So, uh, you know, uh, we want to see, uh, and the question will be, how come Morocco is still actually the leading economic power in, in, in Africa? It's because, uh, you know, there was a management of risk of, uh, of, uh, of deviation and backsliding so, ba so much back in, in years. And also, in terms of the electoral reforms, I just want to add a little point. It's not all about the uh, electoral co quotients. Uh, perhaps the electoral quotient, and we have to look at it, whether it saved the, uh, the PGD from uh, a devastating, uh, even devastating uh, uh, defeat, or actually it saved a uh, few seats, the 12 seats for, for, uh, for the PGD. We have to look at that perhaps the, the electoral quotient uh, was not against the uh, election of uh, the, uh, the defeat of the PGD. And as a matter of fact, after the results, the PGD did okay. not mention the, the electoral quotient. And the, on the other hand, what is important is how the electoral reform has actually uh, pushed towards having more women in the political system by actually pushing forward the electoral li lists, which has more women representation than the national list that has only 4%. Okay. Uh, Mohammed, so we have this electoral structure that kind of uh, provides for equally weak parties, as we heard it phrased. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a respect for the monarchy. Uh, we have, as we just heard, an appreciation for stability, uh, which some other countries in the region haven't seen. I mean, is that, in essence, what brings about then this, this voter apathy? I mean, this was a better turnout this time. It was barely over half the electorate came out. So even though there is this, this democracy, this constitutional monarchy, I'm sorry, constitutional monarchy we see here, uh, it doesn't really bring an enthusiasm out of the, uh, the Moroccan public to participate in the system because they accept it won't bring proper change. Exactly my point, of course. I mean, with all the reforms that we speak about, of course, this is not something that the Moroccan peoples look forward to, right? I mean, even when we talk about 50%, 50% is not that much. I mean, you talk about half of the electorate out there just sitting at home. And I think that's largely because they know that in the final analysis, it doesn't not matter who wins or he doesn't win. The, this is uh, a, a, a government that is controlled by the, the few, and we know the few who they are, right? That's why I'm saying that there has to be certain enablement, of course, of these political parties to take an active role and to show the country, no matter what these political parties are, on the left, on the right, in the middle, 
right, to show what they can do really in meaningful changes and reforms for the for the Moroccan right. people. The Moroccan people want some reforms that are not imposed on them from top down, right? You want to have some grassroots level reforms in which the Moroccan people have some say. I don't think in Morocco today, and anybody, I don't think anybody could agree that actually the Moroccan people have in a control or, or determination of the trajectory of those reforms. The okay. reforms are, are imposed imposed on them. And in terms of election, one thing uh, I want to have to respond to, yes, I mean, Tunisia had their own oh, issues. So they have Islamists as well. They have Islamists that came to power and went peacefully, of course, through elections. What happens right now in Tunisia, people can disagree, could be a, a constitutional uh, misinterpretation or accurate interpretation by, but that's Tunisia. That's another program. And then, okay. of course, with the United States. The United States, the elections did not slide decades. That's okay. just not true because in the United States, they have horizontal accountability. They have a Supreme Court. They have mechanism by which you can actually prevent anything from happening to the... To the and democracy well, has survived. It, I know. I'm going to have to interrupt you there. Unfortunately, we're completely over time, and we didn't even get to talk about beyond the apathy, the many accusations of votes being bought uh, in this election. Yeah. But uh, we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists so much for joining us on this edition of The Newsmakers. Our viewers for tuning in as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter, at the underscore newsmakers. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page. I'm Andrea Sankey. See you next time.